Um, John Guyon has worked for the Forest Health Protection Forest Service as a forest pathologist for the last 28 years in Ogden, Utah. His position involves technical assistance to land managers, teaching, and research. He earned his undergraduate degree in botany at the University of Illinois and his master's in forest pathology at Colorado State, where he conducted research on the impacts of environmental stress diseases of Aspen. I'm really excited to have John here today, um, and I'm going to go ahead and mute off and ask Paul to do the same, and then we will um, help administer the questions at the end of the webinar, and I imagine there will be many questions because we have a lot of people tuning in today. So go ahead and share your screen, John, and um, we will hand it over to him. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to talk today about the insects and diseases of Aspen. And we're fortunate in that addition to me, and I am a forest pathologist, um, we also have Paul Rogers, uh, who is an Aspen ecologist and one of the co-founders of the um, Western Aspen Alliance and the website that is associated with that. And so we have also an expert on Aspen Ecology who can handle any questions related to that. But anyway, we're just gonna dive right in here. Um, first off, I throw a guess out there that I was probably the only one who answered yes to that last question in your poll. <laughs> Most other people value Aspen for a bunch of different reasons, but my personal interest has always been that they're fascinating biologically. <laughs> and particularly fascinating to someone who is a forest pathologist. Mm -hmm. um, one of the ways that I think of insects and diseases is as agents of change, and they're not the only agent of change out there going on in forest ecosystems, but I think that they're pretty important, and that's why I'm here. Okay, so one of the things that I'd like to present to you guys is that aspen is a keystone species. And in talking about what a keystone species is, it kind of got me to thinking a little bit, first off, what's a keystone? And I found this cool little graphic, um, and it's explaining the way that you uh, construct an old school Roman arch. And that's the image on the left there. Basically, you build this wooden scaffold and you start piling stones up from the side. And when you get to the top, you insert a carefully constructed stone that's the keystone and it holds all the arch together and balances the forces from the different side so that then you can remove that superstructure and the arch is freestanding. Well, so that's one way of thinking about what a keystone is. Um, the ecological definition is a little bit different um, and it's just what uh, excuse me, it's a plant or an animal that plays a unique and crucial role in the way that an ecosystem functions. So why is aspen a keystone? Well, compared to conifer forest, one thing is that it has much higher plant diversity and produces a lot of biomass. I'd like to draw your attention to that picture on the left, upper left there first. That's just a little picture of an aspen understory. And you can get the idea that this understory is multi-layered, there's shrubs, there's forbs, there's grasses, all sorts of, and this is a reflection of that incredible plant diversity that aspen forests support. And when you get that incredible floristic diversity, you also have an associated higher diversity of animals and an increase in animals. Okay, so, this is going to be very much for, focused on Western forest ecosystems in the United States. I noticed there that we had one participant all the way from Italy. So um, that's interesting to me, but a lot of the emphasis today is going to be on Western North American ecosystems. So what's chipping away at the keystone in those forests? One is insects and diseases, one thing. Um, there's also a lack of disturbance, and I'll go into that a little bit more here in a minute. Drought stress has played a critical role in what's going on with aspen forests. Other environmental conditions like early frosts have also played a role in some places. And browsing pressure from various kinds of animals is also a very important feature in aspen ecosystems. 
Okay, so one of the things that you need to have kind of underneath your belt when you're talking about aspen forests is that this idea of clonal reproduction. And I'd like to draw your attention first to that picture in the upper right corner there. And the guy is holding on to a root with his hand. And you can see from that, that root has actually three different aspen sprouts that are popping up right out of that root system. So to back up that picture just a little bit, imagine that you're a seed of an aspen and you land in an area where it's suitable for aspen to grow and germinate. So that seed germinates and then it can produce up out of the ground a stem which will become an aspen tree. And at the same time, it starts producing a root system in the ground. One of the really interesting and cool things about aspen is that this spreading root system is capable of producing these sprouts. And they go by a bunch of different names. Sometimes they're called sprouts or sucker sprouts. Um, an actual botanical sort of a name is a ramette. But anyway, they are sprouts that are coming off of this root system. And so because they're coming off of that same root system as that original seed, they are actually genetically identical to that original plant that initiated the, the stand there. And this has some important implications in how aspen ecology functions. Okay, so that general idea of these individual sprouts being all genetically identical is the idea behind clonal reproduction. And once that root system is established in the ground, aspen can actually spread for very long distances and one clone can actually have thousands of different stems. So at this point, I'd like you to draw your attention to that picture on the lower right there. And that's an aspen forest out there on the landscape in the fall. And you can actually see the fall colors starting to turn. I'd like to draw your attention kind of to the right side of that picture and see that all of the stems in that area are apparently turning color at the same time. That is quite likely one aspen clone. So one genetically identical individual with potentially thousands of different stems. And as you look across that landscape there, you can see that there's differences in coloration and see that different aspen clones are turning at slightly different times. Um, one really interesting thing, some research from very recent years has found that there's actually a lot more genetic diversity out there than what ecologists and foresters have been thinking for decades prior to this research. An old forester like me would have looked at that landscape there and said, oh, I can see like three or four different aspen clones across that, that group that you're seeing out there in the landscape. And it actually turns out that there's a lot more genetic diversity. There may be a dozen different genetic individuals across that. And this clonal means of reproduction um, is what's pointing to with that stamp there. Action, Aspen actually is the largest plant in Western North America. Okay, so fire is an essential part of Aspen forest ecosystems. Um, and it is the primary disturbance agent in these systems, particularly ones that are serial in nature. And by serial, I mean that it's an earlier stage in a series referring to forest ecology. And aspen does not only exist in serial ecosystems, and we'll go into that here in a little bit more in a minute. But what happens after a big fire, and kind of drawing your attention down to that picture down in the lower right corner, is after a big fire, aspen is capable even though the overstory may be entirely destroyed by this fire of popping up tons of these new sprouts from that clonal root system that we just described. And over the long term, I've kind of been thinking of this as viewing the above ground part of an aspen forest or an aspen clone as more or less disposable and thinking of the underground part is what's really critical to long-term aspen survival. And I need to adjust my screen slightly here. 
And this leads to the idea that I'm pointing out on the bottom there that one of the other feature why Aspen is a keystone is that it enhances landscape diversity due to this reaction to fire. Okay, Aspen has several different modes, three different modes actually of regeneration. There are stable, serial, and episodic modes of regeneration. I just described the serial condition to you with disturbance driven after a fire, and that's what most people are familiar with with Aspen. But it turns out that some surveys have found that about one third of Aspen is actually stable. One thing, there's no competing conifers present, and disturbance is not needed, and it often will have a continuous mode of regeneration. Some aspen, however, shows an episodic type pattern of regeneration, where reddit regeneration can occur in pulses. Okay, just a little bit of tree anatomy, because this is important where insects and diseases are impacting the aspen trees. Working from the outside in, first off, we have the bark, and its primary function is protective. Immediately inside the bark, there is a layer of tissue called phloem, which main function is to conduct food within the, within the stem of the tree. And right inside of that is the cambium layer, or vascular cambium. And the interesting thing about that is that it's a generative tissue, which produces wood to the inside and these phloem tissues to the outside. And from an insect and disease standpoint, if something gets into the cambium area, and impacts the stem all the way around or most of the way around the stem at any given location, um, that actually is enough that it kills the tree. Okay, one other thing that I wanted to point you to on this slide is that branch um, where it's coming into the stem. And I'll refer to that a little bit more in the next slide here. So those branch scars or branch traces in an aspen um, are unusual in that they have basically no defensive reaction to something that may be occurring on the established on the branch. Most trees have actually a layer of fungostatic, fungicidal chemicals that are accrued at the base of that branch scar. And let get you to look at that picture in the lower left corner. And because of that, they're able to protect themselves to a certain degree from anything that might become established on the branch. Aspen doesn't do that. <laughs> um, and these branches then become an easy pathway for disease entry into the tree. Another thing about aspen anatomy is that the bark is very thin and often still photosynthetic green under a very thin outer layer. That picture in the center of the screen there has actually had just a millimeter or two of the outer bark scraped away to reveal some bark beetles that are active in the area. And you can get an idea of just how thin that outer layer of bark is, often until aspen stems are quite old. And this leads to the idea that aspen stems themselves are often quite easily damaged, and this also plays into the role of insect and diseases in aspen. Okay, so this is my divider here for a pole. <laughs> Megan, are you still there? Oh, yeah, I'm here. I think Mark's just going to launch it. Okay. Uh, all right, I've launched the poll now. Uh, folks, you should sit down on your screen. Let's take, uh, take a few seconds and allow you to respond to that. Paul, I guess we can't vote. <laughs> <laughs> Paul is disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, I actually can't see the results, but well, that's not I'm important. Yeah, vote, vote, votes are still coming in. So let's, let's take another 10, 10 seconds. Okay. All right. Still coming. Okay. I think we have, I think we have a consistency. I'll share. Can you see those results, Paul? I can see them. Can you see them, John? I can, and oh, people, people are smart and went directly to the point of, of that poll, and that it is either um, 
all of the above or that one through three that we had it at in there. Um, the point of this being that the reaction is complex <laughs> and it also ties into the vegetative strategy that Aspen has. Okay, moving on. Okay, I'm going to group Aspen insect and diseases into five main categories. We're gonna talk about defoliators, wood borers, cankers, rots and root rots or root diseases, and bark beetles. One point that I definitely wanted to make right at the start is that these are all native insects and diseases. And to my thinking, have always been part of the system. And they are quite often part of normal, healthy, healthy functioning aspens ecosystems. So the question is still going on in the back of my mind. If you see an increase in insect and disease activity, what's changed? What might be changing? Okay, so defoliators, their main mode of action is that they're removing defoli uh, the foliage, and this causes some depletion of the reserves um, that an aspen clone might have. If you look at that picture in the upper right there, that's looking up into the canopy of a defoliated aspen stand. And you can see various levels of defoliation from nearly complete to eh, moderate defoliation in the center of the picture. And that defoliation is mostly due to that insect that you can see in the lower right hand corner. It's an insect called aspen two leaf tire. And it's like another, um, a number of other lepidopteran, um, butterfly and moth type larvae, but they're eating machines up there crunching away on the foliage. There are also fungal diseases that can cause defoliation as well. And the center picture is one. Ordinarily, if you saw a leaf as heavily infected as that um, one with almost all comprised of black spots there, the aspen response to that level of damage is that it's going to start shedding those leaves. And there's additionally one other foliage disease that's visible in the left-hand corner there. And that's a disease called shoot blight. And that one not only has the capability of infecting foliage, but it can actually move into the stem a little bit. And that one's um, present and prevalent on small stems. Okay, wood borers are just simply insects that can drill into a tree from the outside. And they do this in a, a couple of different ways. Some drill into that inner bark tissue, that phloem tissue is very nutritious for them. And so they're mining around, drilling around inside the tree in the, in the cambial area. Um, some go much deeper into the wood. And I'd like to draw your attention to that upper right hand picture there. That's an insect called bronze poplar borer. And you can see, I think, that there's a piece of bark in the upper corner. So this is one that's a cambial miner. It's digging around in that cambial area. And I already mentioned to you guys that if something damages that cambium area all the way around the stem, like this insect is sometimes capable of doing, that's going to be enough. Uh, I just got an error that scared me um, that popped up on my screen that said my inter internet connection is unstable, but I'm just going to plow ahead and hope that your organized social will tell me if things aren't working here. No, we, we can hear you just fine. Go ahead. You're anyway. Good. Okay, I was just up there to scare me. <laughs> um, some of these insects, however, go much deeper into the wood. And the picture on the lower right corner gives you a little view of what that looks like. That's an insect called poplar borer. And its mode of attack is that it drills straight into the wood. It has a little bit longer life cycle of um, up to two years. And it lives inside the tree deep in the wood tissues. And just give you a little idea of the relative size of the insect in the, those center pictures there. Actually, the one on the far left is the bronze poplar borer, and that's actually the most aggressive tree killer, despite the fact that it's the smallest. These can kill cambium directly, and they also provide wounds that allow for diseases to become established within the tree. So, which segues right into canker diseases. And a canker is just a dead spot in the cambial tissues caused by disease. These are all fungal diseases of trees. Um, they do need wounds, like for example, wounds pro provided by insect borers. 
And the interesting thing to me is always about canker diseases has always been the variable rates of expansion. If you look at that picture in the lower right corner there, that's an example of a canker disease with a very slow rate of expansion. And what's going on with that is that the disease is only expanding just a tiny little bit each year. And then there's the reaction by the host aspen plant that kind of surrounds that with scar tissue, more or less. <laughs> and that process can go on for years and years. That particular tree has actually probably had that canker for decades. So some of these canker diseases are very slow expanding, and it leads to that kind of warty, nasty looking bark that it has on the outside. Some, however, are very quickly expanding, like the center of those three pictures, sooty bark canker. And that one's capable of killing a tree in only a couple of years, sometimes even within one year. And its mode of action is very fast invasion. Um, it actually has some toxic chemicals that it's putting out in front of this quickly expanding um, canker front, and it therefore kills trees fairly quickly. The picture on the left is a, another canker disease called Cytospora canker. And that one is interesting in that its rate of expansion is highly dependent on the level of environmental stress that the tree is experiencing. In a normal healthy stem, normal healthy clone, um, this disease is only really capable of causing very small cankers on the stem or maybe killing a branch here or there. <laughs> But if the tree's under enough stress, this can actually move out much quicker and kill a tree within a year. Okay, so we're gonna talk about stem decays and root diseases. And root diseases are sometimes called root rots. And both of these two types of diseases have enzyme systems that can break down living wood within a tree. We'll talk about stem decays a little bit first. <laughs> And the example in the lower right corner is the most common stem decay organism in aspen. It's called white trunk rot, and it's also the fruiting bodies that are visible in the upper right corner. And the interesting thing about the way that aspen reacts to stem decays is that most trees kind of fight an ongoing battle with stem decay diseases. They go through this process called compartmentalization, where they're trying constantly to wall off the decay organism within a small compartment and minimize its impact on the tree. Aspen really doesn't compartmentalize well at all, and effectively it really doesn't do it. So once a stem decay organism gets into an aspen stem, it's capable of pretty fast expansion compared to other tree species. I'm gonna kind of direct your focus down to that picture in the lower left corner there, and that's talking about this zone right at the base of the tree in the in the butt section um, and in that particular picture you actually have a little bit of a war going on in between the stem decay organism and a root disease so you have this root disease down in the ground killing the roots and also causing some decay in the root system and that decay is moving up from the root system and the stem decay is moving down from the stem and if you look closely in that picture, you can actually see some black lines. And that's actually a zone of interaction where the stem decay and the um, root disease are interacting and trying to inhibit one another. So they're actually fighting a little bit of a battle among themselves. Um, both of these types of organisms weaken stems, and they also have some interesting relationship with wildlife like the little bird peeking out of the stem in the upper picture there. Um, somehow, cavity nesting and cavity creating animals are able to detect these aspen stems that have a lot of decay in them. And those are the ones that they choose to excavate cavities in. Really kind of makes sense, yes? This soft, funky wood like you're seeing in a decayed stem is much easier to excavate. All they have to do is get through the healthy wood on the outside, and they have this soft tissue that's much easier to dig out and create a, a cavity site. Okay, the final group that I'm gonna be talking about here is bark beetles. Um, and these are a couple of insects that feed in the outer bark, and you can see the sort of damage that they cause in that picture on the upper right there. These are tiny little insects. If you draw your attention to that center picture there, 
Um, you can see someone's fingers. And these exit holes for these bark beetles are no bigger than a pinprick. The insect itself is like maybe a tenth the size of a grain of rice. Um, we really never saw these in the Intermountain region before a big drought that we had in about 04 and 07. They still were referenced to them in the literature on entomology, but barely detectable if at all present. Um, one final point on those, one of those seems like fairly aggressive and it's involved in killing trees. And the other one, it really only um, is present on trees that are pretty close to have being killed by something else. Okay, I was told earlier before this presentation that we have a number of people who their focus is primarily on urban forestry. So I did wanna run through a couple of insects and diseases that they're main emphasis is going to be in urban areas. These are the ones that are much more common in urban. I actually said that incorrectly. These are ones that are just more common in urban settings. They're also common in the forest. So Cytospora canker, the one that I mentioned that has a close and intimate relationship with environmental stress, that's very common in urban settings. The poplar borer, the one that drills deep into the wood, is also very common in urban settings. One foliar disease called Marcinina leaf spot, that center picture there, um, is actually also very common in urban settings. That leaf is actually very lightly infected. In some cases, you can see leaves that are entirely brown due to this disease. But the typical symptom is kind of that brown spot with a little yellow halo around it. Um, iron chlorosis, not really a disease, more like an environmental sort of a, a condition. Um, Aspen in the Intermountain West, anyway, is adapted to situations and locations 6,000 feet and up. When we take these aspen trees and bring them down into urban settings, soils are fundamentally different. Quite often they're higher in pH, um, they have a tendency to be compacted, they're just basically not the kind of soils that aspen is adapted to. And so you can get problems with taking up enough iron for the normal function of aspen trees. And so you get this iron chlorosis symptom. And chlorosis is just the yellowing on the leaf. And the kind of classic view of that is that they're only still green along the veins. The rest of the leaf is chlorotic. Um, oyster cell scale is the insect in the upper left picture there. And underneath each one of those tiny little brown flecked part who's sucking their nutrition out of the aspen stem. And it's covered over a thing like a little shield. <laughs> and underneath that shield, which functions as a protection, the insect exists for much of the year. They do have a crawler stage whereby they're capable of moving around. I've seen that one most commonly on aspen where they're not getting enough light, particularly shaded trees on the north side of buildings and that kind of thing. Okay, so a few words about climate. Um, excuse me. So climate forecasts that I've seen have been calling for less snow and warmer summers, which is pretty much a recipe for drought stress. There have also been forecasts that we're going to be seeing an increase in the size and excuse me, severity and frequency of forest fires. Um, additionally, in relation to climate, several insects and diseases are very much enabled by drought stress. Um, there's also been some recent research post-drought that showed that drought stress alone was enough to kill aspen in some situations. Talk a little bit about sudden aspen decline or SAD. And this is a phenomenon which was um, best observed and documented in Colorado. And I know the idea of sudden and a decline are a little bit of a mismatch, um, but this did occur fairly quickly, but it also showed a lot of the classic symptoms of a forest decline type disease. This most commonly occurred kind of at the lower ecotonal edge, edges of where aspen occurs. But we did see this over hundreds of thousands of acres in Colorado when it occurred. And it did occur right after a drought that occurred in Colorado from about 2004 to 2006. 
So post drought, we had this big increase in aspen that appeared to be declining and dying. Um, comparing that to what um, has been referred to as de facto sad or de facto sudden aspen decline, and that's occurring in cases where there's a lot of pressure from browsing animals. One thing that they do is come in and eat off all the sucker sprouts as they pop up out of the ground. Another thing that they're doing is creating a lot of wounds on trees, which can lead to um, more insects and disease activity. So just to compare those, with SAD, you are seeing some root system dieback in some cases and even some root system death. It is occurring on drier sites. It's most commonly associated with what we call a set of weak pathogens. And these are insects and diseases that only really are heavily impactful on trees when they're under a lot of environmental stress. Another interesting fact about SAD is that it's not necessarily occurring on the oldest trees. It's not gonna be impacting seedling and sapling type stands, but once you get above seedling and sapling age, this disease um, appeared to pay basically no attention to the age of the stand, and it was hitting mid-age, older, um, just basically everything along the whole spectrum of age pass once they get to sapling size. De facto said, to summarize that again, heavy browsing pressure, lots of wounded, lots of wounding, wound-related diseases, and it kind of seems like root disease is more gradual, except in one case. And that's the case where something has come in and removed all of the aspen overstory, either a fire or perhaps silvicultural activity. And in that case, if you have animals that come in and eat all the sucker sprouts, you can actually get death of an aspen um, clone fairly quickly. Okay, so one additional role for insect and diseases, and they can cause what I like to think of as aspen dieback and that's pulses of mortality. Say for example, an insect like one of the borers builds up its populations in a fairly short period of time, comes in and takes off an all, a lot of overstory stems. And this happens alone, uh, it's not enough to kill an aspen because you can actually stimulate regeneration by doing it that way. Okay, and one example of that, um, this is from the Ashley National Forest. In that picture on the left, you can see a bunch of dead aspen stems and the pulse of activity mostly of insect birds in that particular stand and there because it's in the fall. But there's a lot of regeneration that's occurring in this stand as well. Um, I know Paul is going to hate this if I say it, but Actually, on the Fish Lake National Forest, where they have a lot of what I think of as de facto sad, they're only really doing silvicultural treatments if they can do fencing treatments afterwards in order to keep out browsing, um, browsing animals. <laughs> Not a very long-term ecologically thinking sort of approach, but it's kind of the reality to them in that they recognize that they have very heavy browsing pressure. Okay, a few trends. In forests surrounding aspen forests, there have been some monumental bark beetle outbreaks in the Intermountain area. And they have killed millions and millions of lodgepole pine, Douglas fir, spruce trees. So they've created some space around in the uh, conifer forests that surround aspen. There have also been some fairly large fires. These two factors, I think, make more room for expansion for aspen forests to move the area which was previously occupied by conifers. Kind of conversely, you've also had aspen dieback and decline. There is this ongoing browsing pressure, and we have had some very big droughts in the last decade or so. And this kind of leads to two opposing trends. If you look at that picture in the upper left, aspen volume has actually pretty substantially decreased. And this is uh, multi-state in the Western United States, Colorado, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, have all seen this downward trend in aspen volume. Picture on the right actually in opposition shows that there's more acres of aspen forest because possibly 
um, they're starting to expand into these areas with conifers around them. Okay, so that's all I got. Um, I do love talking about aspen insects and diseases, and so there's my contact information. Um, if anybody ever has a question about that, um, I'd be willing to talk about it. And at this point, Megan um, yep. and Mark, I'd like to open it up for any questions. Hmm. Sounds good. Um, I've asked people to put their questions in the Q&A pod at the bottom of, your, of their screen. So if you have any burning questions for John that you'd like him or Paul to address, um, please go ahead and do that right now. And I think what, what we'll do is just kind of run through them as I see them sort of pop up on the screen. Um, so John, if you want to look at them as well, um, that's mm -hmm. fine with me and Paul. Go ahead and unmute yourself and you can view the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Um, I'm also going to ask Mark to launch a poll um, that helps us evaluate what the job that we're doing as webinar um, facilitators. So I'm just going to go through um, the first question Chris Madison asked, is the shoot blight a bacteria or a fungus? That is a, a fungal disease, Chris. Um, okay. Easy peasy. Um, Jessica Smith asked, does only aspen trees not have the fungal fighting chemicals in their branches or do all populists such as cottonwoods or poplars not have this as well? Populus as a, a genus is notorious for not being a um, good compartmentalizer, but um, I'm actually gonna have to say, I don't know as to the genus populus as a whole. Um, I do know that condition about aspen, but sorry, I don't know that about all poplars and cottonwoods. Okay, and uh, an anonymous viewer asked, are other species of poplar susceptible to oyster shell scale or just aspen? There are a number of species that are susceptible to oyster shell scale. Uh, in the um, poplar genus and even some fairly um, dissimilar trees are also susceptible to oyster shell scale. So not just aspen. Okay. Um, aspen is circumboreal. How do aspen insect and disease organisms differ or not elsewhere in the world? Okay, so aspen, if you're looking at it more broadly and thinking about uh, the different species of aspen, um, that is a really challenging question. <laughs> Most of the stuff that I'm familiar with is going to be from North America. I do know that very similar things are going on in Canada as well as the U.S. Um, unfortunately, I do not know very much about what's going on with Europe. I know that a drying, warming climate is going to be all the way around the world. Um, so I suspect the good news, so, but I don't actually know. The good news is we have people tuning in from all over the world. So if somebody has thoughts on that, um, feel free to tune in or chime in on the chat pod if, if anybody wants to take a shot at answering that question. Um, that's one of the benefits of this format is we can get feedback from anywhere and lots of experts are joining us today. Um, Lisa asked, which animals eat aspen sucker sprouts? Does mowing in an urban environment have the same effect? Okay, I'm going to answer the first part of that and then hope that Paul will chime in with some additional information. Um, in forested ecosystem, the biggest two are going to be elk and deer. I've also encountered areas where um, wild horses are causing a significant impact. Um, domestic animals like cattle and sheep will also eat aspen sprouts. Um, Paul, do you have anything that you wanted to add to that? <laughs> uh, no, not at this time. <clears throat> Just in terms of the urban lawn effect, I mean, essentially it's the same, uh, but they, they, both in urban and wild situations, the sprouts or these young ramets will try to re-sprout and re-sprout and after a few years they'll finally run out of energy, but it makes for a very uncomfortable lawn in the interim. Yeah, I, I talked with some urban foresters before this presentation on how that they like to approach um, managing aspen in an urban setting and the way that they approached that is that they wanted to try and more or less mimic what nature was doing. So 
trying to devote an area where you're going to grow aspen with the recognition that you're going to try and keep the aspen stems young and you just, as sprouts pop up in the areas where you want them, you just leave them there to replace the other um, stems as, as they die off. So you're just kind of mimicking the natural pattern a little bit. That's actually a timely um, question because we have a fact sheet coming out um, with USU Forestry Extension that talks about how to grow aspen um, in an urban environment. So um, stay tuned for that because that could potentially answer some questions there. Um, so Tyson asked, how does root grafting in aspen play a role in clone diversity, disease transmission, etc., when two different clone clones roots contact and fuse? Okay, I'll try and answer a portion of that and then maybe kick it to Paul. Um, the root disease would probably the, be the most interesting one in terms of carrying disease through a disturbance and potentially by any grafting or fusing of the root system. And some root diseases, in particular armillaria armor, root disease, have the capability of moving through the soil for a distance and they also can move by direct root to root contact. Interestingly, um, the most common root disease in Aspen is actually um, a disease called Ganoderma um, root disease. And it does not seem to carry well through any stand replacing type disturbance activity. So it can gradually build up as um, an Aspen stand develops, but it doesn't seem to move through any disturbance activity. Um, and therefore, a good approach to that disease is simply to regenerate the stand. Um, any further comments, Paul, on grafting or anything you know about that? <laughs> yeah, that's a fascinating topic. First of all, I wanted to compliment your audience on really great and diverse questions that are really challenging, John and I. Uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's an individual, this, this idea of grafting basically is in its infancy in terms of our understanding. Uh, but there's a woman called uh, Annie D. Rocher, who is at the University of Quebec, who's done some fascinating things with this and learning about diversity and its role in the forest and how uh, live clones can keep, quote unquote, dead clones alive and perhaps uh, increase diversity in forest through this root grafting mechanism is really fascinating. But it's also something that we know little about and are just starting to learn about. Yeah, you, um, our audience is uh, well rested and coming with lots of good questions today. So uh, James asked, um, it was said to pay attention to what was underground and that activities such as fire, fire would affect the overground vegetation, but the sprouts would be fine. What about with disease, damage, defoliation and such? Will the underground growth come up okay or will it be affected by what is happening above ground? Another really interesting and challenging question. Um, I like to think of this as kind of an overall physiological view of how much an aspen might have in terms of reserves. Um, if you do have something, obviously, that's impacting the overstory trees and causing a depletion of the overall physiological reserves that an aspen clone might have that does have an impact and over the years in these sometimes complex systems where you have grazing damage you have insect and disease activity going on you have a gradually drying site um, all of these things are going to cause a drawdown in the basically the reserves that, a, that an aspen stand might have and i've long held a speculation unproven in my mind that when you have a lot of disease and other damage gradually drawing down the reserves that that's going to lead to a reduction in the suffering capability of an aspen clone but i do not know of any research that directly looks at that but it only makes sense to me that if you're gradually drawing down the reserves of an aspen clone that it's in the long term going to have an impact um, anything to add to that, Paul? Yeah, just in terms of one incident, and this is a generalization, you could think of it as a way to, re the, the death of the overstory um, above ground clone is a way to reinvigorate the clone by sending up those new uh, sprouts. And so they 
They tend to be more resistant at a younger age to some of these factors uh, for, as John mentioned, till they're maybe 30, 40, 50 years old or so, and then they're more susceptible to them. But as, as a renewal mechanism, I'm only talking about a one-time event as opposed to long-term, which John was talking about. Um, you also have the, you often have that reinvigoration of the stand and, and at least for some time may be more resistant to some of these uh, pathogens and insects. Would you corroborate with that, John? That sounds good to me. <laughs> okay. Um, an anonymous attendee asked, please address variability in disease and insect resistant, um, resistance among Aspen clones. Okay. Um, I'd like to start that one off with the foliar diseases and insects. Um, and there has been some research that uh, indicates that there is some accruing of uh, chemicals in aspen foliage that are um, toxic to insects and cause some degree of resistance to herbivory, not only by insects, but by animals. Um, some research by a guy named Lindroth, if you wanted to Google that. Um, there is also evidence, um, if you are out looking at, an ans at a landscape in years when you're having um, a bad outbreak of uh, foliar fungal disease, you can look out at different aspen clones across the landscape. And it's actually an interesting way to pick out um, differences in clones in the landscape. There is variability in resistance to these fungal foliar diseases. I do not know of any variability in resistance to canker diseases. Um, and most of the other resistance that I know of to, um, excuse me, wood borers and some of the more aggressive canker diseases has more to do with the physiological condition of the stem than it does inherent resistance. Uh, that's the best answer I got for that. <laughs> okay. Um, another question. We have found that treatments that are very aggressive, that damage roots, seem to be less likely to regenerate than selective thinning. Is there any truth to this in your experience? I'm gonna kick that one right to Paul because he just literally wrote a book on this. <laughs> yeah, so there's variability in that. That's a great question also. But there's some older research from the 70s uh, in Colorado where um, damage that takes place in aggressive um, cutting actually uh, increases the amount of um, infection by pathogens and other kinds of damages, physical and pathogenic damages in forest. So that's above ground. But then the damage to the roots, I would say, is a mixed bag in my experience and in some of the things that have been documented. So aggressive damage, um, that's a judgment call. But oftentimes breaking uh, by running heavy machinery over um, root systems causes more sprouting and a more vigorous response. And we see sprouts um, coming up or ramets coming up right in the treads of uh, D9 cat uh, tractor treads. So, uh, sometimes it's helpful uh, if there's too much of it, it can be too damaging. So I'm going to give you a sort of a plus minus answer on that one. Thanks, Paul. Um, Chris was wondering, can you talk a little bit about American hornet moth? What are some preventative measures? Are there signs when the tree is beginning to go into decline due to, the, due to this pest? Okay. Um, another really tough and challenging question because that's not... Um, an insect that we have much of an issue with um, in the area where I primarily work. <laughs> I'm gonna have to say, Chris, um, if you wouldn't mind sending me an email, I can research that and get you back an answer. Um, I'm not going to try and fake my way through that one because I don't know enough. <laughs> okay, Lisa asked, I would love to hear more about the issues and challenges of aspen growing in an urban environment at lower elevations. And Lisa, um, stay tuned for our fact sheet coming out about that. Um, just want to plug that again. But either, either of you have any other thoughts on that, go for it. Chime in. Paul and I have had some conversations of, about this and both a little bit uh, discouraging in general about trying to grow aspen at lower elevations. Um, when I was in graduate school, the thing that I absolutely loved about Aspen is that it gets everything. 
and it's super easy to do uh, certain kinds of research on it because you can just basically look at it wrong and it gets sick. <laughs> um, there are some inherent challenges in something that is as insect and disease prone as aspen is. Um, and the additional challenges of the sprouting and getting the sprout where you want them to are not. Lifespan, I think, relative to the natural forest, you should approach aspen as if it were a tree that probably only lives 20 to 30 years at a maximum. Um, the major insects and diseases are going to be poplar borer, uh, that marcinine blight is, is very common, um, cytospora canker anytime that they're under stress. Overall, my approach would be kind of twofold. One, if you want to maintain aspen, um, if you want to have aspen on your landscape, don't just plant one, plant 10, and designate an area where you want to have it. And in that area, you promote suckering and all the rest of the areas you <laughs> treat it kind of um, as something that's a little bit of an undesired plant. Any additions to that, Paul? <laughs> um, not really. I tell people it's kind of a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You either get, it either gets everything as John alluded to and dies or the opposite is it sprouts everywhere. In general, it's not a great uh, urban tree, but if you really desire it, um, I, I would key you off to the uh, pamphlet uh, that uh, Megan keeps uh, alluding to because it's tricky, let's say that, it's very tricky to deal with, and um, I think it's best to go at it slowly and kind of think of it as a colony instead of individual trees. Yeah, this webinar will be recorded and put on our website in about two days, and so I'll put the hyperlink to the fact sheet in that list um, on our webinar website. Um, Tracy asked about poplar twiggle, Twiggle fly. It's very common in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Any good controls available that either of you know about? Okay. Um, not one that I've ever had uh, people being concerned about it enough. Um, off the cuff, I would say from the conditions and types of damage that I've seen that it's not ordinarily a very severe issue around here. Uh, and I do not know of an insecticide that's registered as a protectant. Um, so I guess I'm going to have to say overall, I don't have a great answer for that. That's okay. Uh, Mike asked, is herbivory related to rely, excuse me, is herbivory related to livestock grazing the leading contributor to the overbrowsing in de facto sudden aspen decline? Livestock grazing certainly plays a role um, in most of the places, however, where I've seen um, aspen being consequentially damaged by um, grazing animals, it's not ordinarily domestic ones. It's elk and deer. Um, actually did one study in the Northern Uinta Mountains, and it was an area where they had multiple use by elk, deer, and cattle. And in that particular spot, you could look at this landscape and see that there was some browsing damage and evidence of cattle. John is frozen. Yeah, so. he's frozen on my end too. Hold on. Frozen in time. Uh oh. If I if I talk, will that take up the baton, so to speak? I was sure. Say, Paul, yeah, you're up now. <laughs> yeah, I agree with uh, John there, and and all the studies across several western states. Uh, I'll probably get in trouble for this, but I would say two thirds to three quarters of the problem is wild ungulates, and and a lesser a bit of the problem is domestic. But I have to emphasize, it's very different in different situations. There's some landscapes where sheep dominate and other landscapes where cattle dominate, but many, if not most of them, are elk or deer issues. And there's, I also say there are many areas where there's not a major mountain, uh, browsing problem as well. So it's real uh, location specific. Great. How do you feel about being our uh, Q&A person for the last couple of minutes? 
I, I could try. I don't know a lot of the stuff John knows about pathogens and insects, but I can uh, fumble okay. my way through it or uh, admit when I don't know something. No worries. Okay. How do you feel about leaving wood chips in thinning and clearing? And is this is is the benefit of holding moisture and increasing organic matter outweighing the potential increase in inoculum source? A uh, great question. I don't know the last part. I can say that in uh, areas that have been strip mined, they've used some mulch and had some very good results. Interestingly enough, for seedlings, uh, true sexual reproduction seedlings coming in as well as suckers, I don't know about holding the inoculum. So I'm, I'm sorry, I can't fully answer that one. Okay. Um, what can the mountain homeowner do to protect trees on their land? Are there any su sustainable practices that won't harm beneficials to help aspens? Uh, sustainable practice. Well, um, again, I'm going to fumble my way through this a little bit, but uh, thinning of conifers near your home and leaving of aspen will leave some level of fire protection. That could be a good thing. Um, it's very, very difficult to prevent aspen from getting these pathogens that John discussed over the last hour. I think they're going to get stuff. They are easily infected by so many different things that there's not much a homeowner can do to protect those other than this strategy that will be talked about in your pamphlet that we talked about to keep uh, sort of cultivating new ones. And so, like I said, you're raising a colony instead of individual trees. Great, I'm just scrolling through to try and weed out the questions I think you might, <laughs> you might have an answer to. Is John back on or can we? I don't think so. You know, he's working from home today, so we knew that and I, um, I'm very pleased he made it through about 57 minutes of our, our his talk. So um, okay. I think I'm just, maybe we should just leave it there. Um, so thanks again, everybody, for joining us today. Paul, did you have something else to say? I just wanted to mention uh, that uh, the Western Aspen Alliance is a co-sponsor of this webinar, along with uh, USU Forestry Extension. Thank you for doing that, Paul. I appreciate that. I um, forgot to mention that. Yeah, Paul. Um, suggested that John be our speaker today, and I'm really glad that he did because um, we obviously had a great response. So again, this webinar will be on our website in the next two to three days. So keep your eye out there. And if you want CEUs, I put the link many times in the chat um, window, but um, there's a, a hyperlink to a Google form. Um, so please follow, follow that link. And um, thanks for joining us, everybody. And thank you, Mark. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, John. We will email John and say thank you to him. <laughs> thanks. Have a good day, everyone. Okay. Have a good one. Thanks, bye -bye. Mark. Bye.